and we are live okay hi everyone thank you so much for being here um for those of you who are joining in hopefully you already know me because you're on this stage but i am surubhi i run a dog behavior and nutrition practice called luchi and muttons and i'm based out of india um and i've been doing these lives on facebook for a, you know for a couple of uh, times now um and just talking about different topics that I wanted to sort of deep dive in. Some have been solo, some have been with other professionals in the space. Um, and today is a really exciting topic. Uh, I've been wanting to talk about just attachment in dogs, in and and just the nature of relationships between pet parents and dogs for a while now. And I thought that we could do this with a slightly different spin and bring a little bit more um, of a psychological. perspective to this um and so i'm really happy to have uh, soniksha here with us uh soniksha do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can start uh, okay uh well i'm a psychologist i've been in the field for about 3 years now uh i practice with a relational psychoanalytic lens which basically means that uh the relationship that i come to share with my clients or patients is uh, the most important medium source uh tool uh at my disposal and uh yeah awesome awesome so i love i love the relational psychoanalytical lens because and i and i love the emphasis on the relationship that you share is the most important because again i think with um you know dogs specifically i think the relationship that they share with their caregivers um mm. is fundamental to everything that um is fundamental to like how we can support them right and and that's such a big part of um you know the bark's way uh, which is you know where yeah. i've also graduated from so I'm excited to deep dive into this um for everyone watching um if you are here just you know drop us a comment let us know that you're here if you have questions if you have um stories experiences that you would like to share then do share those in the chat box um and we can definitely engage with those Um okay I think Suniksha has logged off by mistake uh but we'll just wait for her to come join right back um but yeah in the meantime if you're here just just drop us a hi let us know you're here um and we can we'll just wait for her to come back in and then we can take from there okay and she is <laughs> awesome yeah. no problem hi biggy um she's here from germany okay awesome cool so um let's start i actually wanted to really zoom out first um and start by talking about like why is attachment important right um and <laughs> also because i feel like what's happened is that um mm, i think just i think we just you know mainstream narrative or just like pop culture i feel like attachment um has become like this really wishy washy you know soft kind of a word um which comes with a lot of different like perceptions and connotations uh you know it's not it's not it's not it's not as much of like a hard concept as let's say you know discipline and obedience and control and and so and you know the context that i'm bringing is that it definitely comes up a lot in the way that we care for dogs and the kind of relationships that we build with them um but attachment also serves very like important functional quote and quote perspectives uh for human beings and so can you tell us a little bit about that like why is it important I mean to begin with I don't think attachment is meant to be hard um mm -hmm. I think it's meant to be soft and uh uh you know when you said why isn't attachment important the first thing that came to my mind was this uh, very well known experiment in psychology around attachment um I'm not going to go into too many details around it but the idea is you have baby monkeys um and one group is placed with a wire monkey and one group is placed with a monkey made out of cloth and soft materials and the monkeys mm -hmm. inevitably choose the baby monkeys choose the one that's made out of cloth so mm -hmm. i think um things like discipline control 
they sound hard because they are hard i think they come in at a much later stage but mm. initially it's meant to be soft it's meant to be cloth and cushiony um mm. and i think that way attachment even the word right it evokes very bio physical images of clinging mm. grabbing holding mm. touching uh mm. and those are soft experiences they can also be hard that is not to say but um those were my first those were my first few thoughts and the second one was i think um everything is political and i think of care also as something that can be political in that there is a politics in care and mm-hmm. uh when care is emerging from a space of wanting to control that's when we move towards discipline and obedience mm-hmm. but whereas when we look at care as about building something uh fostering something and creating something it won't really be about control as much as it'll be about spontaneity and responding uh mm. as opposed to dictating something so that way mm. attachment i think is something that's uh a response to spontaneity or a lack of if that makes sense uh mm. in that um you know there's a psychoanalyst called winnie cot who really mm. revolutionized the idea of uh, mothers in psychoanalysis before his work came in they were quite um in the sidelines in theories and he has amazing things to say but one of the things he talks about in terms of what is a good enough mother is just a mother who's present and able to be spontaneous um mm. in the sense that there's no predetermined set of responses or rituals but it comes up every time the baby or a dog presents mm. a need and mm. every time a need may not be met in the same way the need mm. for a need to be met could also vary like right? <laughs> a dog may not want connection simply in the form of play maybe play one minute and being pet the next or being held the next um mm. so just because a dog in this case is that's a reaching out for connection it doesn't mean it has to be the same form of connection every time so to sort yeah. of be able to read that that requires a presence and a certain kind of spontaneity it requires mm. you to kind of not be um attached to uh, a prefixed idea of what it means mm. to care for somebody um mm. so yeah but uh, circling back to why attachment is important i think uh, attachment is a prerequisite to uh, survival mm. um right like mm. within the animal world or even with humans uh babies need to be around their caregivers newborns mm. need to be around their caregivers they need to be attached because without that attachment um actually what coming to my mind is i think attachment is the psychological equivalent of an umbilical cord <laughs> right mm. like that's what feeds you supports you when you're in the womb and then you can get out of the womb and you don't have an yeah. umbilical cord anymore but you need to be attached to the caregiver mm. and i think that's what attachment mm. is um mm. yeah yeah you said a lot of really interesting things which i'm going to use later as quotes uh, <laughs> to get people to watch the live uh, whenever they're up and about in different parts of the world um but i think um i think you you talked about like attachment when you were talking about the experiment with monkeys you talked about attachment being like soft and cushiony um and so like is attachment cushioning us from something does it have the ability to cushion us from things um, i think so I and think, i think like uh, yeah i think it goes back to like the question of you know i think that goes back to the question of like what happens if there is no attachment so then what is attachment cushioning us from i mean psychologically i can say this for humans i'm i'm not so sure where that would stand with animals but um being alive is a terrorizing thing <laughs> mm. right um coming into the world is a terrorizing thing you start mm-hmm. out life in the womb where it's dark there is something like water 
uh, you're held, you don't have to move around much, it's pretty hushed. And then boom, bam, you are in a hospital room with bright lights yeah. and beeping machines and loud noises and everything is a threat. Uh, babies are cushioned. Why are babies swaddled? Uh, mm. you, right, that's a cushioning. That is cloth. Um, and they're swaddled tightly, but they're swaddled because they need to be, they need to feel like they're held and they're in something that's mm. keeping them safe. So I think mm. on a psychological level, attachment is a cushioning from the terrors of being alive. It makes being alive somewhat bearable. Um, mm. When you can find that sort of, like it's a refuge. I think when we're constantly saying it, cush it is cushioning, it's, it's, I'd like to think of it as a bed you get into after a long, tired yeah. day, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It has the potential. I don't think all kinds of attachment feel like that, but I think that is the wish in wanting mm -hmm. to be attached or being attached to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think the sense of like attachment um the wish for attachment to provide this kind of like security and comfort um you know especially and i and i and i, and I resonate with you i feel like even in in general i think yes the world being you you talked about being alive is terrorizing but i think the world in general is very scary yeah. um you know there are just so many things all the time and and you know you can sort of create microcosms of it right and we see that with with different with different dogs particularly dogs who are extremely anxious and fearful and even reactive right where seemingly uh, non threatening triggers can feel very threatening to yeah. them um and in the face of those triggers what what brings security and comfort and i suppose that that is that kind of attachment to to a caregiver um and and you used mothers but i'm going to use like caregivers in general because again sure. you know in, yeah. in the context of dogs you know i think it comes down to caregiving per se uh irrespective of the the gender of it perhaps um and so you also happen to mention that like in most form in most kinds of attachment this is this is what would happen right this is this kind of cushioning is what one would experience um and do you want to talk a little bit about like just i suppose because again right i think um the literature on attachment and especially all the work done by bolby etc they talk about types of attachment right and i think the the type of attachment that you were referring to um as much as i imagine we don't like to box things or categorize things per se um seems to fall under the definition of what we would call secure attachment right mm -hmm. um but then there are also other types of types of attachment so can you tell us a little bit about that as well um that's interesting because i think um you know the three main types of attachment that bolby talks about which is secure insecure and anxious um avoidant anxious avoidant yeah. but um i think it's also so much like you said it's difficult to box things in but and that's also because it's complicated because i think these three styles also really go to show the um relationships with experiences like separation uh mm. anger hurt mm. uh mm. the hope or the assurance that something broken can be repaired, right? Mm. Um, so I think in that sense, the way I would, if I, I wouldn't be pompous enough to say redefine, but at least the way I have recategorized it in my mind mm. is I think secure attachment is where there is um, faith that the person you are attached to will return, uh, where mm. separation feels bearable. It, an insecure mm -hmm. um, attachment or an anxious attachment rather is uh, where you understand that somebody has to leave, but it makes you upset and angry, but there's also room to express that disappointment 
and then mm-hmm. move towards the repair and then your complete mm-hmm. avoidant is i would say there's no attachment in the first place because then a separation just feels like utter death it feels mm-hmm. like having been abandoned perhaps there's no hope that you can also express that hurt and rage and so you just completely turn away and towards yourself and that's mm-hmm. really the interesting thing uh, psychologically that you know babies or infants who are unable to i think find that attachment with their caregivers they turn inwards they become their own caregiver or their own world mm-hmm. um in a very sort of uh, if i'm to use a clinical term narcissistic kind of personality structure where the world is not meeting my me- needs so i'm going to be the mm-hmm. world that meets my needs that's a lot of rage mm-hmm. at the world mm-hmm. and not having been able to attach yourself to something um mm-hmm. so <clears throat> i think when we talk attachment we can't do it without also talking about separation yeah yeah because at some point while you were speaking i was also thinking about um Mm. the leash with dogs mm. mm-hmm. it is a way to keep your dog tethered to you mm-hmm. right but the only i suppose from whatever i've observed uh it's not just as a caregiver testing out the environment whether it's safe enough to let the dog off leash but it's also having you having faith in your dog and your dog having faith in you in the bond and attachment that you share but they'll respond to you you'll respond to them yeah that you can bear to let them off leash but also more importantly i suppose they can bear to be off leash and be curious and explore yeah. right yeah. um and uh, there's a another psychologist psychoanalyst who's worked a lot on attachment um, margaret marlo who talks about how um the safety in attachment is knowing you can leave but that you have some place to return to mm. and i think that because i'm talking and that's the image that's coming to me is pretty much i suppose what the experience of being off leash is for the yeah. dog yeah. knowing that i can wander off but this caregiver is here mm-hmm. to come get me or i can run to if i need and i'm going to come yeah. back here and that comes from having a secure attachment or some attachment where there's faith that i'm not being mm-hmm. abandoned or uh, my dog's not going to run away from me or whatever yeah. you know yeah um, yeah yeah absolutely i mean i'm actually um like i'm actually struggling to like pick the thread <laughs> that i want to deep dive into because <laughs> there are like so many different threads uh in my brain as you spoke about um and i think yes absolutely like uh, so okay let, let me like go you know bit by bit because i'm also now struggling to like articulate everything that i'm thinking about um, do it whatever you want to talk about can you yeah i mean i think i was just thinking about how um and i've always said this i've always said that i find like the way that we approach um our relationships with our dogs um at box is very you know relational psychological um as opposed to uh, you know like cbt which is perhaps more anchored in like behavior modification right mm-hmm. and and thoughts thoughts to behavior kind of process and so i think when you were talking about the leash example i was just like oh my god yes 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 and it just felt like a really higher level of what we do uh, or how mm-hmm. i support clients in getting to that place um but i think that uh absolutely I, i think that even when i when i think about examples where i have worked with clients to help them uh walk their dogs outside i think a big part and a, I, i don't do that necessarily in the first conversation i do that much much later in the consultation because the first part of the consultation the foundation really is to say how can we help you build more safety and connection in your relationship first with your dog right because that needs to be and i think it goes back to what you said about attachment just being so basic to survival like that needs to exist first in all its ways and forms and there needs to be faith there needs to be trust that your dog 
um, will respond to you and that you will respond to your dog, right? Uh, in yeah. all its many ways. And um, I think that's where that bit about the politics of care comes in, right? Because when mm -hmm. you're trying to control your dog or discipline your dog, which is what most of the trainers do, yeah, there's not much that is being um, focused on in terms of building faith and trust and making room for the dog being a sentient being, right? Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't really care about that because what you want is when you say sit, your dog sits, so that when people come over and your dog's running, you can control your dog. Uh, yeah. And so I think that's also. I don't think you can talk attachment without it being like the confusion you experience right now. There are so mm. many threats. I don't know what to pick because I think people opt for discipline and control and obedience when they themselves can't bear that confusion of there are mm. so many things to juggle and manage and it's too much. So I much rather just be able to say, sit, sit, lie down, lie down, don't go heel, lock my dog in the room for a bit, give him a time yeah. out shakes my hand yeah. when he wants, as opposed to bear the confusion and mess that attachment is, right? Like, um, and as I'm saying that, I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know, birth was coming to my mind where birth is such a messy process. Mm. But it's so intimate and there is so much mm. that one has to bear by while giving birth mm. or even carrying their baby, right? Um, mm. And I think that translates. I think people who can find in them to create that space to bear the mess of relating to another human or sentient being yeah. will automatically find themselves in the throes of attachment as opposed to obedience and discipline and control. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that, yeah. 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 I think I also think it's it's about to me, I think the confusion, bearing the confusion, bearing the messiness, I feel like is perhaps like one step, like a level two. I think the level mm -hmm. one is how do we embrace the softness of attachment, right? Because again, I think that in the you know, in the context of dogs, I think there is so much uh, and, and you're right it, it is political right because now we're talking about we're talking about power structures we're talking about ideas and notions of equality um we're talking about um one person in this particular relationship having much more power having much more authority uh laying down the law of the land so as to speak to another person who is regarded as not equal who is regarded as um smaller uh who is regarded as less of a being right in this mm. relationship and so when those politics kick in um it's also very hard to get in touch or be open so much to the idea of softness right because i think softness in that sense perhaps has the ability to like dismantle these politics dismantle these structures um, in so many different ways. Um, and so I'm also thinking about how for, for a lot of people, this idea that I need to be, I need to work on my attachment or I need to work on my responsiveness or I need to be more spontaneous or even so much as I need to just figure out a way to meet my dog's needs seem like, what are you even talking about? Because, you know, it's just like, like you said, control is so much easier. Control is so much more. You, you'd also... There's a sense of um, I don't have to feel to also be able to control. I just need to know that I am more powerful or that I am in a position of power. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think you, it, that's pretty spot on when you say I don't have to feel to control because I think that's literally the defense that controls. So you, yeah. Feeling feelings is so much that you much rather yeah. just sort of simplify the equation, so to speak, and slip into control. But yeah, it's interesting because there's a it's 
from whatever I've heard or seen of like trainers and what they say, or even, you know, this is common myth around ki, oh, this dog is trying to assert dominance. You have to be the alpha one in the room, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. not as if according to common myth or urban legend, whatever you want to call it, dogs are seen as the smaller, lesser beings. In fact, mm. they're seen as somebody or something that is fighting you for power. And in yeah. some way, I suppose that that's the fear, right? That, oh, they'll bite me or they'll do this or they're so aggressive. They can do whatever they want. Um, as if, I don't know, like on the flick of a button, a dog can turn into a killing machine, right? Like, yeah. uh, so then I think in that in that context, this idea of discipline, control, training is also reclaiming power that you are threatened mm-hmm. will be taken away from you. So yeah. I suppose... I mean, of course, I, I I don't work with dog parents. So I don't know what all must could be driving that confusion and fear of softness of attachment. But I suppose that's the fear that if I turn soft, am I going to lose my power? And is For this sure. other being going to have more power over me? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you said, you know, laying down the law of the land, et cetera, et cetera, because um, these are also... I mean, I'm a psychologist, I'm going to bring gender in, but very masculine ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And, For sure. and that's the other thing, like in psychoanalysis, when we say mother, we don't necessarily mean uh, female by birth. It's it's the yeah. softer attachment, right? And you want to look at it biologically. Um, I suppose the softness of attachment is also associated with the maternal because um, most uh mothers mm. feed their babies whether that's animals yeah. or uh humans yeah. right you're attached to the breast or to the teeth of a yeah. cow or whatever it is so yeah. um but i think that's a very and which brings me to something else that i think in in psychology as well for humans attachment is not it's often looked at as just a two person thing but it's always a triad mm. There has mm. to be the maternal, the paternal, and the baby. Mm. Now, whether that one person can embody both, that's a question to mm. ask. But if there is one person laying down the law of the land, there sh- must be another person or force or object that does the other. Mm. Right? And vice versa. So when you were mm. talking about laying down the law of the land, actually what was coming to my mind was your hand signal. Um mm. Because there's a mix of softness there in terms of mm-hmm. not screaming, yelling, saying no, but it's also mm-hmm. a boundary yeah. and um, it's a communication. Now, what you would know, what the dog reads is, does that mean they're saying this is dangerous, this is threatening, I shouldn't yeah. move forward? Um, because, of course, the hand signals used in multiple ways. I've seen you use it for food as well. Now that's more of your need than it is the dog's need to save the yeah. dog from the food. Um, yeah. So it's not as if within attachment, you can't lay down laws. You can, yeah. but you can do it without a sense of control, obedience. Now, if we talk about the hand signal at the table, if yeah. Luji or Martin would still persist, you would realize they asking for some food and provide them with that. So even though you're saying no, which is laying down the law and carrying out more of a paternal function, you also come back around and provide that sort of maternal function of softness and I'm going to pay attention to your needs. It's not threatening to you that they want to eat what you want to eat. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, Yeah. uh, Those are some of my thoughts to this. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I think I think in in what you were describing with like the types of attachment, I thought what was really um, there was something beautiful about what you said when you were describing secure attachment, and you said separation is bearable. Hmm. Um, and the reason why I thought that was really beautiful is because again, you know, um, there were. Uh, you know, there there have been a bunch of different studies done now on on dogs and their attachment styles and and stuff like that. And um, I think one particular 
uh, one particular study talked about how dogs with separation related disorders um and my sense is again this wasn't detailed out in the study but my sense is it, it essentially related to separation anxiety right um really fit into the insecure anxious attachment cluster right um which i suppose would 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 make sense uh but what i really loved about the word that you used was bearable because i think that in a lot of the cases that i work with and especially when it comes to separation anxiety um i think the expectation from pet parents often is i just want this to stop like i don't want my dog to have issues i want my dog to i want my dog to stop being anxious about separation right uh and when you said bearable i think there was just this sense of acknowledgement that separation is hard yeah. and that doesn't have to change like we don't have to change that but how we cope with it uh yeah. can perhaps differ and yeah. the meaning that we draw from that separation can perhaps differ but yeah. in no way does it mean that separation stops being hard and i find that often yeah. like pet parents do have that expectation that my dog is having a hard time with us leaving today i want him or her to be absolutely fine the next day right and that's the place that i want to get to without acknowledging that separation is hard um yeah and yeah. I, i mean you know that's true with humans also i think so many people um come with the wish and the hope which is really a sign and of of it being more of a plea of wanting to just immediately get better or be happy so to speak mm. and i mean of course on one hand that's a reflection of the sheer helplessness and unbearableness of whatever experiences they're carrying but on the other it's also uh, a symptom of the world we live in which is this very yeah. capitalist pharmaceutical heavy you take this pill and this will be gone blah 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 kind of world of quick fixes basically where yeah. i feel like in general our ability to bear certain experiences is shrinking except for um which is again which comes back to where soft attachment or slowing down mm. and being able to feel your feelings mm. in the presence of another makes all of these unbearable things bearable again that was one and the other is i think um, what was coming to my mind was uh, you know if you in in human experiences birth in itself is a separation that you're in mm. the mother's body and then you're suddenly out of it yeah then once you weaned off the breast that's another separation um and life is full of these kind of separations and something that was coming to my mind was that uh, again winnie cot who has who's done quite exceptional work in attachment in infants has this idea of a transitional object hmm. which is basically a blanket a soft toy it could be anything that the baby sort of associates with the mother could be because of the smell could be because of the texture and so if the mother is away but the transitional object is around it helps the baby to kind of separate because there's something reassuring and comforting there is still some yeah. presence and absence right yeah um and you will find many equivalents of that through so many adult uh, lives as well like maybe needing a night light at night yeah um yeah. maybe having a particular blanket or a particular hoodie that you yeah just cannot do without um you know and often times when i think like people leave or have to move abroad they leave behind an object of theirs mm -hmm. to their loved ones to hold on to right so these yeah. are ways separation becomes bearable and what i was remembering was i think initially when luchi had come in there was some uh, music that you found that mm -hmm. would help her right mm -hmm. that's also some kind of a if i can loosely call it that a transitional object that it was yeah. there was some sense of presence i don't know what luchi made of that music what it did yeah. for her but it made yeah. you're not being at home somewhat bearable for her yeah. um yeah. so yeah and i mean i also felt curious because i wonder what 
it feels like to the dog to be left behind like that mm. um you know i mean that's because it's not a child or a baby who you can explain to the concept yeah. of going to work or going to a party or whatever yeah um so i mean yeah i was wondering what uh, yeah yeah i, I think it's i think it's about. yeah absolutely and i i think it's a hard one right because again so many times like i've, I've sensed and i've experienced the frustration of pet parents going like I'm telling my dog I'm going to work. You know, I am telling my dog that I will go, I will come back. I am doing this routine day in and day out. Um, and he still finds it hard. And I'm like, yes, because it is hard. Uh, you know, and I and I think it is that. I think it is, it is um I I, I also think it's I also think there's again, right? Even here, I'm, I'm I'm experiencing like separation of what I mean. And just to sort of piggyback on what you're saying, I think separation of separation of um, or a disconnection from someone's lived experience or something, right? So, for example, I think a lot of the times it's just that, oh, my dog is back at home, but there's also so much going on around the house without a pet parent being there right like just now for example there are birds tweeting there is traffic there is some construction sound outside all of this is happening in the space that i am in right and that continues to happen and each of these things bring about different feelings and senses and uh connections and thoughts for for dogs so it's it's never just they're just at home right there's there's a full yeah. day that's panning out for them in that time um which could also make separation really overwhelming which could also and i think again it goes back to the fact of the scariness of the world mm. is what they're encountering even when they're home alone and they don't have that one person they don't have that secure base to then return to okay. and find comfort in and so separation can can just feel very very overwhelming as well yeah and i think like two things came to my mind one the more immediate one was you know so what if your dog is feeling anxious when you're away and pees all over the house yeah. um you know like there's i i feel like saying entitled to have a response to that separation right like if it were a baby yeah, yeah, absolutely they cry yeah. scream whatever if the dog's continuously barking and i think it's it's I don't know much about the dog care world but I feel like these are problems <clears throat> these are behaviors that have been deemed as problems by the training mm-hmm. community right like these yeah. are problems that need to be eradicated oh, um, yeah. yeah yeah because like you said separation is hard so the dog is going yeah. to have a response to it and uh, you know similarly in psychology like at least my school of thought we don't see symptoms as problems that need to be done away with in yeah. fact they're symbols rather of mm. something deeper of how you can communicate yeah. with another person yeah. right um i imagine if now the dog has come uh, has peed all over let's say that's the thing that they do when they're anxious that's a symptom that when you come back that i suppose the dog was either scared or overwhelmed and needs just a lot of connection and care in that moment as opposed yeah. to being scolded and whatever yeah. else or thinking like now how do i make my dog stop peeing when i leave the house yeah. right yeah one was that and the second was i think you know i think this a lot because i always feel like i don't think i'd be able to get a dog simply because i wouldn't be able to devote mm. that much time and care right now and so maybe i should mm. get a cat but something that always stops me is am i buying into the myth that cats don't require mm. as much care as dogs like i don't know i if i know anything about dogs it's because of you i don't know anything about cats yeah. and their needs yeah. and now if i get a cat and i find that a cat has somewhat similar needs to a dog i'm going to be screwed because i don't have it in me <laughs> to take care of a pet right now yeah. so i'm not getting yeah. a cat but i yeah. think that's the idea right that people think even with dogs you get a dog you get a plaything you get a cute fuzzy little thing to have around 
Yeah. And the more you interact with what a dog's actual needs are, the more you let yourself feel that dog is a sentient being, the more demanding does the dog start yeah. to get, which is so overwhelming. Yeah. Because you think this yeah. is just going to be like something around the house that I can go to when I want yeah. to cuddle or when I want to pet. Yeah. Um, but now if the dog needs me 24-7, that's not what I signed up for. And I imagine yeah. that must be so anxiety provoking um, yeah. and must drive a lot of reasons why do difficult dogs get abandoned, right? Like, are they really difficult or is it really overwhelming to realize that what you've brought home is a sentient being who needs you? Yeah. Right? So, yeah. And I think, which takes me to something else. I think for attachment, it's also very important that people are open to being needed and to mm. needing. Yeah. You know, I think needing has also become something that's been so problematized. Um, yeah. Having needs is a problem, yeah. whether that's dogs or humans. Um, yeah. And then add to that being needed also. Yeah. Right? Like in, in, I see it as almost like a cycle where my needs are not being met, but somebody needs me. And I can't yeah. show up for this person because there's nobody showing up for me. So it's empty cup, empty cup, empty cup everywhere. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. who has time for attachment or like building yeah. an attachment? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's interesting you talked about like, hmm. It's interesting that you talked about the. And the reason why I'm mentioning is this because, again, there are a lot of people who will end up who are watching or, uh, you know, who will end up watching who are very research driven. And so when you were talking about like attitudes, right, like what symptoms versus uh, problems that need to be fixed, there, there are studies to show that dog owners attitudes towards their dog and towards the relationship with their dogs um, actually determine how how they view problem behaviors right so if um if 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 there is a dog parent or caregiver who has a very secure relationship with their dog who is in tune with their dog they're less likely to see problem behaviors as problems right uh but and then the opposite of that is you know when they when, when they're slightly more disconnected when they don't have uh those foundations of of attachment in place of of a secure attachment in place and they're likely to see some of these behaviors as extremely problematic and really difficult and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I thought it was interesting that you talked about like these attitudes because I also feel like what most folks end up doing is they sign up to bring home a dog into their space um, from a very functional perspective. Mm -hmm. Right from a very functional, from a very look perspective. And then once they get into it, they realize, oh shit, this is no longer functional. This is emotional and this is relational. And um, I think human parents also do that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, like I think it, it just the conversation on uh, having kids for the sake of it versus really wanting to have kids. Right. And I think people just realizing along the journey that oh my god like this is this is a lot more than just doing basics um and yeah i absolutely love what sajanya said here as well like the moment you have needs you are labeled needy right um yeah and i know that you and i have like taken arnav's case on this so many times because he will often call luchi a very needy dog um but i think there's just so much to like unpack over there as well right um yeah his own you know yeah I think like this thing of realizing that this entails so much more than what I thought circles back to what I said at the beginning about a good enough caregiver is spontaneous because spontaneity yeah, is not sure. just instant responses. It's also to be able to completely change your entire world view or perspective if you're presented with new information, right? And yeah. to abandon a stance you have can be so threatening for people yeah. psychologically that again, you resort to control or obedience. And yeah. this idea of being labeled needy, like I I remember for the, uh, I, I think I read this somewhere recently about how unmet needs is uh, something that starts feeling like greed, 
you know mm. um like i remember we started this conversation around luchi a lot if we keep feeding her she'll just keep eating it's like she'll never stop but that's not true she might yeah. Eat eating to a certain point, but she's not going to yeah. eat beyond what she wants to eat or needs to eat. Yeah. Or yeah. within Lucy's case, I'm going to stick to wants to eat. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think her wants are much bigger than her needs, but yeah. uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Also, she's a desire filled <laughs> yeah. dog. Yeah. Desire is also important. <laughs> so you know you're alive when you want and long for things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was a sick, yeah. But so I think, and again, I think hunger, and I don't just mm. mean physical hunger, psychological yeah. hunger, things yeah. are driven by hunger. Uh, it's so that's one of the things that's psychologically very terrorizing for humans, because yeah. when a need goes unmet, for you know, for babies, so they don't have a yeah. sense of time. So when yeah. they're in need of something, it feels like it goes on forever, which is why they're so like relentless in their crying yeah. and their need to be tended to urgently. Because it's only yeah. when the need is met, just the pain of like being hungry mm. sort of subside, right? But yeah. now, if that sort of need goes unmet, 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 that terrorizing feeling is going on endlessly. So then, when yeah. your need starts to get met, there's such a backlog that it might take one month, two months, six months, five years yeah. for those needs to feel fully met, and there's nothing wrong with that. Even with therapy, there's so much pressure for um, 18 sessions and fixed yeah, and ready to like leave. But there is yeah. a backlog of unmet needs, and yeah. that could take up from two to ten years. Who's to say? And yeah. then there's the whole debate of oh, but so much dependence, blah blah blah. But it's because there has been no room for any kind of dependence or attachment that there's such yeah. a deep need. And yeah. I think something that was coming to my mind was whether that's pets, babies, uh, clients or patients for therapists. Um, I guess until people are okay with their own needs mm. and how deep they run meeting somebody else's needs yeah. is always going to bring up a world of feelings that could be hatred envy uh, anger uh, indifference you know nobody yeah. met my needs so why should i meet yours that could be an unconscious mm. narrative we don't know of it could yeah. be so many things so i think It's it's important to kind of know what you're signing up for when you have a choice to be a caregiver. It's different when you're yeah. thrust into that position. Born into it, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. if it's a choice, like it is to adopt a dog, uh, I don't know if that's a problematic statement to make in dog communities, but <laughs> I don't know. Is adoption a choice? Like bringing home I mean, a dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, can okay, you can okay. choose to adopt versus choose to buy. So no, which is why. But huh. anyway, never mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Like I think it's important to know what you're signing up for. What uh it means besides just either getting a dog for a guard dog purpose or a mm -hmm. um. I don't know those yeah. teacup dogs that people want to ferry around in the handbags, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Sounds <laughs> disdain, <laughs> and your tone is just remarkable. Um, but okay, Biggie here had a had a comment which he left a while back, and I just saw it. Um, I have an avoidant attachment style, and I believe that there is still attachment, or rather, the need for attachment. It's neurologically hard hardwired into us. Also, Hella and Levine attached raise an interesting point in that avoidant or anxious attachment can be a survival strategy, all depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Do you want to respond to this? Like, no, yeah, I think that's I true. I think um, the way I think of it as a survival strategy is sort of mm. uh, um, you don't trust that the world around you can meet your needs and. It feels safer to be avoidant than to yeah. be dependent and then maybe um, mistreated, misused, and just have your needs go on unmet. Um, yeah. 
you know i think turning away from the world it's 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 like being a tortoise or a snail you have mm. your shell you retreat back you yeah. turn into you retreat from the world because the world mm. seems like it's not going to meet your needs and i think biggie is right that doesn't take away the uh, desire for attachment um yeah. at all yeah yeah absolutely and yeah mm sajanya is saying i think a lot of people are themselves not very attuned to their yeah. attachment patterns and even a recognition of emotional needs absolutely for sure yeah and i think that we see this particularly i think um you know in in so many ways when when i do consultations with pet parents um and even in my own journey like with hawks right i i think that as i was and i think we always get the two kinds of groups that when you are um learning to meet the needs of your dog it can throw up like a mirror it throws up a mirror mm-hmm. either way right uh which is like oh my god i have needs that are unmet um and that relationship with your dog can either inspire you to also find ways to meet your needs and really think about um think about you know your attachment pattern think about what's going on with you or it can feel so overwhelming and so um scary to the point that i think it becomes unbearable that mm. you also then move away from it and then perhaps you know just retreat into that narrative of control and discipline because there's yeah. also something um there's also something about that narrative that leaves a part of yourself behind you know mm. um yeah what part do you think it leaves behind Oh wow is this turning into therapy? Um No, I'm just curious. <laughs> I think it is that part, right? Like I think it, it, what we spoke about it the confusion, the messiness, the vulnerability, the rawness of it. Um right? Like I don't for example, I don't want to understand why my dog is having a hard time because if I try to understand why my dog is having a hard time then it might throw up things about myself it might throw up things about my yeah. relationship with my dog it might throw up things about how i am unable to meet their needs that might throw up things about myself in uh you know so many different things so i think it becomes like this you know very like messy pot of a lot of the themes that we've already spoken about um is that something that comes up in your sessions with your pet parents and this uh, clients in the sense of when they begin to understand the needs of their dogs is there a lot of guilt and shame that comes with that experience yeah of a sort big of part. realizing what yeah mm. a big part of it a big part of it um i think guilt and shame for a lot of them do come up especially in um i think is especially and and i i see a different i see different groups right i see clients who just by conversation are able to um experience that guilt and shame in some cases when we do video debriefs for example i'm able to sort of point out what they are doing that needs to be done differently and that brings up a lot of guilt and shame um and then i think there are clients um and saujanya who's who's here has spoken about it multiple times who just exist in denial right uh, or who exist in a space where um you know when we talk especially around like punishments uh when we talk about courses or a sort of uh, versus methods of, of um having dogs respond a lot of them will come back saying listen i was punished as a child i was hit as a child or i was shamed as a child i was scolded as a child i don't know fine you know so what's the issue with us doing it for, with our dogs um so we we definitely do get those emotions um as a part of conversations which is also very revealing about them right um and so i think with each admission i think the the way that we support them and then building that kind of attachment looks very very different um i think that where there is guilt and shame again it's interesting where there is guilt and shame i think sometimes we as consultants have to become that secure base for them 
mm. where we have to provide them that comfort and source of attachment and security um and where there's denial we have to also provide comfort and attachment and yeah. security but the way that we do it looks very different for for both sets of people yeah i i don't know what in particular about what you were saying was evoking this but like um i think like biggie also pointed out regardless of your attachment style your need for attachment persists we are social animals it as yeah. a dog and uh, and in that way i think there is a resilience in humans and dogs mm. to make it through despite failures in caregiving right i think it's only when mm. it's constant failure yeah. and failure being a loose word here but when it's constant failure from the get go that it does really something catastrophic to uh, either the dog or the human being in question but it's impossible to be perfect at meeting somebody's needs there will be times given your own mm -hmm. mental state or, or physical state where you will be misattuned here and there or you will not want to put in the work to read something um but it's not as if that singular moment is going to define uh whether you've succeeded in meeting your dog's needs or not it's it's a trajectory it's the overall sense of yeah. like Okay, eighty, seventy percent of needs have been met, and I think, um, which brings me to a quote that is on your merch, right? Like I think, while the narrative of late is shifting towards how do you provide care in a way, whether that's to babies or dogs, in a way where they thrive as opposed to just surviving, yeah. Yeah. I think that also somewhere, and it's a great movement. I think it's so important. um but at the same time i think it somewhere ends up undervaluing how important it is to just have survived also yeah you know like i think somewhere if your basics which is yeah. food water shelter are met and you are just surviving that is also enough so even whether mm -hmm. that's like pet parents who are coming around to this form of caregiving or actual parents yeah. right i think to that guilt and shame it's also important to know that your dog has survived and with adopted mm -hmm. cases especially right like you do not know the yeah. survival rate yeah. at least they sure and yeah. there is a chance of something um yeah. and uh, yeah i think even getting to a point where somebody is just surviving is a big deal and Yeah. once that survival can be taken for granted a little bit yeah can the sort of thriving begin yeah. right and sure. that's where i think the resilience comes in where you resilient enough to wait where you know that something to is being met ki i'm still alive yeah um, yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah um okay we've got a few more comments that i'm going to put here Shrutika says, "I really resonate with the fact that you mentioned attachment is messy. There's a false misconception mm -hmm. that everything proper is in order, and whatever is not must not be proper. If that makes sense, it does make sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I um, I have actually a really I don't know why this evoked that thought, but I what was coming to my mind was attachments like kichdi." you know in the mm -hmm. sense that khichdi is used as a metaphor of sabka khichdi bana diya mm -hmm. but it's actually there is a process behind making khichdi it's not yeah. just a mess yeah. you know like i think attachments a lot is a lot like that where it is seemingly messy and sure everything is dumped together but there is a process behind it um yeah. and it serves a process of soothing you uh, khichdi is comfort yeah. food also yeah. so and sure. that means yeah. but yeah 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 for sure and and i think it's i think it's um i think it's interesting as well right and um because i because again in in the dog space i think so much of what is seen as proper versus improper comes from a view of obedience comes mm. from a view of good behavior um and it's often assumed that if your dog behaves well oh then you have a great relationship with your dog yeah um, babies also right but 
yeah absolutely right uh, but if your dog is not listening to you if your dog is exercising agency exercising free will disagreeing with you uh, then clearly that relationship needs some work um, yeah and i i think that's so interesting that you brought that up because that l- loops back to what secure and safe attachment looks like mm-hmm. because you know professor of mine had said this that oftentimes parents will say oh you were such a good baby you never cried but there's nothing more heartbreaking than that because the only way your baby expresses its needs are by crying yeah so what does it mean when a baby hasn't cried at all as a baby yeah. no needs yeah. have been voiced because there's no hope that those needs will be met so why voice it at all so you know yeah. when a dog is misbehaving at least yeah. as security enough to attempt to express itself that way yeah. right like there's Absolutely. nothing sadder than an unresponsive baby or an unresponsive dog yeah so sure. i think that, yeah. that that in fact if we were to flip that narrative on its head a quote unquote misbehaved dog is the dog that is a sign of a good relationship yeah with Absolutely. the parent absolutely absolutely and and i think yes absolutely because i think i we say this a lot in especially like um when we uh <clears throat> i mean i've experienced this obviously first hand and then with a lot of clients i've experienced this as well where when they bring home um a dog from a shelter or they've brought home a dog who's literally been abandoned on the road and they bring them bring them home um i often tell them that the signs of misbehavior or the signs of naughtiness mm. is your dog experiencing security and safety at home yeah yeah right and i think yeah. we have to flip it to saying that my because again right i encounter so many people who will say oh but my dog wasn't like this my dog was very well behaved didn't beg for food didn't go into certain Congratulations places the reason that the dog is now not <laughs> well behaved yeah i would say yeah, you exactly, were doing something right? right absolutely and i think it takes it, for them as well i feel like it's it's such a jolt when they when i articulate that perhaps the dog was also in a was the dog was perhaps also shut down right there was yeah. no space to articulate those needs there was no safety to experience what they wanted to experience and now there is safety to do that um and so can we at least start there first right uh, yeah, and can we use that understanding yeah and i think with dogs right like in particular um what gets labeled as being misbehaved first of all it's it's such a problematic categorization but like i think of luchi where i suppose in another household this would be misbehavior mm-hmm. when she wants pizza mm-hmm. and she stomps her hind legs <laughs> right like it's a tantrum yeah. and how yeah. there's an ambulance wailing there are legs being stomped there is her tongue going everywhere but that misbehavior is also her character trait like i wouldn't yeah. know luchi as a dog without mm. it right mm. otherwise it's just it it's like having a stuffed toy what is the difference between having a stuffed toy dog and an actual dog yeah. it's the way yeah. they emote they express um yeah. so much of that misbehavior is just communication and it's telling you who your dog is if luchi yeah. did behave that way we wouldn't know she loves the hell out of pizza right yeah. like um yeah so yeah i mean how else do you figure out what your dog's personality is if they're not yeah. sort of coming out and expressing themselves behaviorally yeah absolutely um okay i have one more comment here uh sajanya says i used to have a very anxious attachment style but i've realized i've properly transitioned to somewhere around the avoidance style mm-hmm. when i sense a feeling that people are not showing up and i'm glad i'm able to recognize that both are from a place of broken trust in the people around us to meet our needs or help us meet our needs so this is an interesting one and and i wanted to know your perspective on this but do you find like that these attachment styles are fixed or do you find that they are fluid um what is your take on that like is it possible i mean i know i know that the reverse is possible right so for example even in how you were describing um i think you were talking about insecure attachment and you were talking about scope for repair right and and i would imagine even with avoidant anxious there is scope for repair but 
is it like if you have if you're securely attached then you're securely attached and that it doesn't change or, or what is your take on that i don't think so i also again i think like attachment styles are um I think they're resilient to some extent. It, it's it's a question of what mm -hmm. you've experienced long time as opposed to them also not mm -hmm. being fluid enough to change with every interaction that yeah. determines yeah. your thing. But I think it's important. Um, I don't know. I was thinking, I think there's somewhere in at least I think the fate of an attachment style rests a lot on the capacity for hope, if that mm. makes sense. You, you know, if there is still hope that, yes, the world has mostly been bad or broken me, but there might be one person or one thing out there that could also yeah. be a dog um, or a cat or a plant. Um, mm -hmm that this thing gets me even if humans can't yeah there is hope and at that being said i mean i don't think you know these are three types of attachment styles as opposed to being like a prize giving podium yeah. of secure it first and this is second and yeah. this is third yeah. this is great this is bad this is worse yeah. it's just a reflection of your relationship with the world and that is what it is and it can change um and it depends on what you want and what you're looking for and need out of your life some people can maybe even thrive with an avoidant uh attachment yeah. style right so um yeah i don't i mean of course the world would feel fuzzy and warm if everybody was securely attached to one another but that is not to say that that's the only right way of existing or the yeah uh, only ideal way of existing yeah and yeah i think something else that's coming to me is that people have to be um worthy of being securely attached to <laughs> you know, yeah like and you prove that worth i suppose by having some kind of goodness that stays more than your badness in very simplistic yeah. terms yeah. Um, and yeah if you don't find people that seem worth that then you live how you live till you find that person thing yeah. Dog, plant yeah 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 and that's an interesting segue because i think i also wanted to sort of the last question uh the last or the last theme that i wanted to sort of close um with on was how, how does one go about i suppose building the secure attachment you know how does one find it as a caregiver or as on the other end let's talk as a caregiver because i think that might be more uh i mean I that might be more helpful yeah it's showing up uh mm. is, is what i would say and then to break it further down and really simplify it is i think like with buildings the foundation is what matters um, mm -hmm. and the foundation i think in an attachment style is the structure mm -hmm. uh, so for with dogs for instance um them being able to trust and take for granted that they're going to get their big meals for sure mm -hmm. yeah that they're going to have a place to pee and poop that they're going to have a place to sleep um these are the basics right and yeah. to know that they will be fed on time when their sort of clock strikes yeah yeah um, that's the structure to the structural needs i suppose the first to meet those consistently and then you add yeah. the layers to it yeah right yeah. like even with babies it's it's being fed having their diapers change, knowing mm. that the caregiver is going to show up when they have a need. Um, yeah. In therapy, so much of the healing actually happens just by knowing that this time of the week of the day, I have a session. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. So I I think it's it's really um, the security comes from the structure. Uh, yeah. And then the rest falls in because once you trust somebody to be consistent and reliable. Yeah. The rest kind of falls into place, and then that's where you know it's not like one single thing of you having failed is going to completely change my attachment style. Yeah. Can yeah. I trust you for the big picture, or the base big picture, stuff. for the sort of like bones yeah. and skeleton of it? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that comes from showing up and being around. Yeah. You know yeah. that's why yeah. so many caregivers take a sabbatical after having a baby. That's when <laughs> the baby needs you the yeah. most. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, Biggie had one more comment. Apart from hope, I believe it also needs acceptance. Acceptance for what is and what is possible based on my attachment style. We need to take it from there with ourselves and with our dogs. Anything else mm-hmm. only results in judgment and pressure. Yeah, yeah for I sure. I th- I, and I yeah. think that's a very intuitive way of uh, providing care for yourself and yeah uh, somebody else to know your limits and uh, yeah. because sadly as human beings we don't have all the power and all the ability and yeah. um magic or love to give and yeah. uh yeah knowing our limits can be heartbreaking but also freeing and that's what acceptance mm-hmm. is right you leave what you can't do or can't have and work with what you do um yeah and like I said, secure attachments aren't the ideal. And yeah. it's okay to have other forms of attachments or it's okay to not be at that ideal of either caregiving or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's yeah, I think knowing your limits is, is a very intuitive yeah. and uh, helpful way of caregiving, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that it also, because again, I, I feel like, I, I love how you've emphasized that it's secure attachments is not ideal because I think there is a sense to want to get better, want to do more. Uh, you know, it feels the like uh, it's not the ideal. Like as in, as in, it's not. Yeah. You know, we we I think some somewhere somehow we place it on this pedestal yeah. that everybody has to get to, irrespective yeah. of where people currently are right and it doesn't work like that it's not like yeah. a it's not like a you know it's not like an end goal per se to meet right i think that there is um i think every if if it all be together everybody will get there at their own pace and time and and they need so many things for that to come into place right um but i also think that especially when it comes to caregiving for another sentient being um you have to do what you can with what you also have right and yeah i think you yeah. talk about limits i think they're boundaries whatever you whatever you may call them right at the end of the day and it's not to say that within what you have like it's less or it can't yeah, be enough and, for for everyone involved there yeah and i think like that just uh, wraps it up really well because i don't think attachment is a one-way ticket to ever being free of grief <laughs> yeah there will yeah. always be losses. There will always be something to have grieved or to grieve. Yeah. Um, and that's also part of any sentient being's life. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot avoid loss. You cannot avoid grief. So even yeah. if you are the most securely attached person in the world, does not mean yeah. you are not going to have pain and discomfort and heartbreak. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Awesome. Okay. On that note, we shall end. Uh, we're 15 minutes over time, although there wasn't a time per se, but I did imagine that we would not go on uh, for this long though. But um, yeah, thank you so much uh, to everyone who is there and who shared comments and uh, who tuned in. Um, this was a really special talk i hope it was i hope it was meaningful and valuable to everybody who did tune in uh thank you so much for Niksha, for taking our time in your afternoon uh and being You're here i welcome. hope you had a good time yes yeah. i did awesome so the live is anyway going to be on my facebook page uh forever so folks who who already tuned in who would like to rewatch it you'd like to share it with other people who you think this could be helpful to please do go ahead and do that and i will 
See you all again another time. Thanks so much, Sajanya, for being here. <laughs> awesome. I'm just going to wait in case, actually, yeah, in case there are any, any more comments or anything else that people would like to share. I'm just going to wait for that as people sort of tune out. Okay. Cool. Okay, awesome. I'm going to end the live now. Thanks, everyone. Take care.